Global Platform Evangelist to Esper. I use they, them pronouns, and we are here today to talk about cybersecurity career success for neurodivergent individuals. I would like to thank you very much for joining me. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things in this presentation. First, we're going to talk about what is neurodiversity. If you don't know, we're going to tell you. And then we're going to briefly touch on how to get started contributing to open source software and why that's important. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about overcoming roadblocks and employing learning strategies, goals for career and education success, how to ask for accommodations, which I just noticed is spelled wrong on that slide. Oh, well, it's fine. There's two M's in accommodation. <laughs> and then we're going to have a little thing, things to think on about how we can improve InfoSec and cybersecurity, how we can make this community better. And then if we've got some time later, we'll do a little Q and A. So first things first, what is neurodiversity? Before I get started with this, I'd like to actually preface this by saying that I am actually neurodivergent. I have, I am autistic, I have ADD, I have dyspraxia and dyscalculia. So neurodiversity is broadly defined in academia and across mental health professions as an umbrella term for the following. Again, autism, ADD, ADHD, Tourette's, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, speech conditions, sensory processing conditions, and many more. Um, among many neurodivergent individuals, there's been a movement to accept and embrace the validity of self-diagnosis and our own unique lived experiences. You don't have to have a formal piece of paper that says you are autistic, you are dyspraxic, you have dyslexia. If you feel that you are a part of that community, that is fully valid and you belong here. Congratulations. <laughs> when discussing neurodiversity, remember an individual themselves is neurodivergent rather than neurodi neurodiverse. It's a semantics thing, but it is very important. So just something to be aware of. One of the things that you can do to get started in cybersecurity is contribute to open source software. And contributing to open source is a way for neurodivergent individuals to often kickstart their career in tech. And it's how I got started actually, was contributing to Kubernetes and contributing to Spinnaker. Contributing to open source is a way for new developers to apply what they've learned to a project and to learn to work with a team. That's something that it really teaches you is how to collaborate with people and how to open a pull request, how to get on GitHub and really start to understand what a code review looks like and what that process is like in an environment that hopefully is safe and kind and welcoming of people that are neurodivergent. That being said, contributing to open source can be really daunting, actually, and it can be accessible and actually it can be inaccessible <laughs> for many neurodivergent individuals because there's often a lot of jargon in open source communities that you may not understand, they might use abbreviations, they might use words, they might use terminology that you don't know. So if you're neurodivergent, there should hopefully be a readme or someone that you can talk to in that community that can answer questions that you have. And if they don't have a person on hand to talk to to answer questions about how do I submit a pull request, how do I get started contributing to this project, you can hopefully find someone on Twitter that should be able to help you that is involved with that community. Another thing that you can do is to look for InfoSec and cybersecurity events with a volunteer program. Others can often have an entire track dedicated to presentations by teenagers and young adults. I know for a fact that Mozilla Festival had an entire track dedicated to presentations by young adults and children at Mozilla Festival 2019 in London. So if you are interested in presenting at Mozilla Festival, you should definitely check it out. They have one virtually this year. Um, and I know that the Diana Initiative um, accepts volunteers that are over the age of 18. So if you are turning 18 this year and you are a woman or a non-binary individual that is in the cybersecurity community, you could volunteer at the Diana Initiative. Worth looking into. And you can also consider putting together a talk or a proposal on a cybersecurity topic that interests you or a showcase a project you've worked on that shows off your skills in cybersecurity, something that you're interested in. There are a lot of interesting events that are out there that you should take advantage of and that you can present to. And of course, 
sometimes you're going to fail and that's okay. That's the, if there, you take one thing away from this, it's that it's okay to fail. That's all right. You're going to fail. You're, I've had massive failures in my career <laughs> and I have had massive success and these two things can coexist at the same time. Don't let anybody feel that you don't belong in cybersecurity because you're neurodivergent. You belong here just as you are right now in this moment. That's, that's critical. You are valid and it is important that you are here because this industry needs people that are neurodivergent. We have a lot to offer. And I think that we're changing the world in a lot of ways. There's always going to be another opportunity. There's going to be a new window when every door, something, something, doors and windows, you know the expression, when one door closes, another door opens. It's honestly pretty true. There's always going to be another opportunity. And while a, a failure may seem really catastrophic in the moment, you should remember that there's going to be something better that'll come along. And that believing in hope is really important. You can write down, record an audio note, or talk through what you learned from that failure and identify what you can improve on for next time. Because if there's a learning opportunity to take away from it, you should explore that as much as you can. So what does success look like? How do you map out what your educational success and career should be? That's a lot. And I, it's, it's really difficult from person to person to say what success looks like because it varies. Is success to you financial stability? Is it having enough money to do the things that you want without having to worry? Is it a long-term career that you can work at for your entire life? Is it respect from your peers? Whatever that looks like to you, you should sit down and say, what does success look like to me in this moment? What would it look like to me in five years? What would it look like to me in 10 years? And that's important to um, recognize that success is different for everyone and figure out what that's like for you. Another thing is don't compare yourself to others. What their success is, isn't going to be the same as yours. And that's one of the fastest ways to get really sad and really discouraged is comparing your success to someone else's. You are just as successful and even more successful today as you were yesterday. And as long as you keep growing on your successes, you will, that will compound. You'll be more successful over time. And it doesn't matter if somebody else is famous or somebody else has a bajillion Twitter followers. If you are continuously improving yourself, that's, that's key. That's critical. You have, you have become a better version of you and that's important. And then of course, you've got to set clear measurable goals with your school counselor or your college advisor or whoever is involved in your education to make sure you're on track to get where you need to be. So sit down with them and say, here's where I want to go. Here's what I want to do. How will you help me get there? And that's their job. That's another thing too, is some people are scared to bother the counselor or bother their advisor. That's literally what they get paid to do is to help you. So please take advantage of that. They are there to help you get where you need to be. And if you're looking at doing a boot camp, do your research. Um, there are some that aren't so great, and there are some with really predatory lending practices. Please don't get involved in a financial commitment that may harm you in the long term. <laughs> Another thing is, if someone in a leadership position is making you uncomfortable or harassing you, block them and report them to an adult. Don't let any adult tell you that you ever have to do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable in order to succeed in this industry, because that is fundamentally not true. Next up, asking for accommodations. What does it look like to ask for help? The fact is we all need help and asking for help is a really important thing to know how to do well. It's okay to ask for accommodations in a job interview. And if a company doesn't ask you if you need accommodations, you probably don't wanna work there. So I highly recommend taking a moment, especially if you are artistic or you have ADD or you have ADHD to say, I might need a little more time to answer interview questions or to think through an answer to a whiteboard problem. You have a right to ask for those accommodations and to have those be respected. So at school, accommodations can look like the ability to use a calculator on a test. You can record your teacher's daily lessons with a voice recorder or even on your phone, because they have that now. <laughs> 
They didn't when I was younger, but now they do. <laughs> you can also ask for untimed exams in many situations, although I will have a caveat here that this is unfortunately a difficult thing to achieve. Many schools want you to have an individual education plan, also known as an IEP, or a diagnosed learning disability. If you think that you might be neurodivergent and would like accommodations in your education, please speak to your school counselor. Please speak to your school psychiatrist. Say, I would like to get tested for a learning disability. How can you help me? Because again, that's their job. And you should have accommodations to succeed in your education with everything available to you. And you can take those accommodations with you to college. Don't let anyone think that accommodation ends when you turn 18. That is not true. I went to university when I was 30 years old. I did not get my bachelor's degree until I was 33. There is no time limit on education and you don't have to jump right into college if you don't want to. You can take a year off. You can go to college when you're 22. You don't have to go right when you're 18 if you don't want to. <laughs> but if you do, those accommodations don't stop the minute you turn 18. You can take your IEP with you. You can take your education plan with you to college and say, here is what I need to succeed. How will you accommodate me in my classes? What will you do for me? Because again, that's their job. And you have a right to succeed in your education. And you have a right to have your accommodations validated, respected, and adhered to. So now that we're here, let's think on how we're going to improve this InfoSec cybersecurity space. So I'm gonna ask you some questions <laughs> and you can think on them throughout the week that we're here for CyberCamp and at, during this event. What can we do as a community to improve the InfoSec open source contributor experience, career tra trajectory and learning outcomes for those that are neurodivergent? How can we break down these barriers and make this path easier for people to start? How can we introduce these solutions in a real and meaningful way that enacts change in this community? And what are, you know, one or two things that you feel would make a career in InfoSec more accessible to those that are neurodivergent. How will you build upon what you've learned today to implement those in your own communities and especially with your friends? I know that some young adults may say really mean things about people that have ADD or mean things about people that are autistic. How are you gonna take that back and confront people that say those things and say, no, that's not okay. And what are some things that you'd like adults to know about what it's like to be a neurodivergent teenager or young adult today? What's it like to be a teenager with ADD? What's it like to be a teenager with dyspraxia, with dyslexia, with dyscalculia? What is that experience like? If you can share with us, it will help us be better too. As an adult, it will help me be better because I can help other neurodivergent people that are like me as adults say, here's what people that are coming after us that I might be hiring someday will need. So that's very important. What can adults like me do to help you? Even though I'm also neurodivergent, everyone's different. So we have to see how we can help each other. And if anybody's got any questions, I'll take some time to answer them now and we'll see what's what. Lee, thank you so much. Thanks, Rin, really appreciate it. Um, so we do have a few questions for you. Beautiful. Um, so the first one, pretty straightforward. You mentioned yeah. a pull request. Absolutely. Uh, can you explain what a pull request is? I sure can explain what a pull request is. Actually, when you're on GitHub, if you go to github.com and you sign up for an account and you go to an open source repository, I again will recommend Kubernetes. And oh, I hope you can see my captions because it actually spelled Kubernetes right. I'm impressed. <laughs> I can't see if it is showing my captions. I hope it is. Um, but if you go to Kubernetes, you will see the readme and you will see a little bar at the top that says pull requests. And when you write code and submit it to a repository, you have to create what's called a pull request that takes what's on your computer and sends it up to the repository so people can look at it. And you can't just put whatever you want in there. Somebody has to actually like review it. So that's a pull request where they can look at your changes and say, okay, everything looks fine. We can merge this into the master document. It's basically, think of it like editing in Google Docs. Somebody has to accept your changes first. You can't just go in there and do whatever you want. <laughs> you have to have your edits approved by somebody else first. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I just wanna just, clarify and point out that we've got about 40% of people who aren't from the US attending. 
And so yeah, some of these people fine. are going to be from areas where, um, where some of the things you're talking about aren't as, uh, aren't as, what's the word I'm looking for, open in, in, mm -hmm. in the places where they talk about. Right. So, so the first question in, in regards to that is that you mentioned non-binary. Mm -hmm. And we got a question asking, what does non-binary mean? So could you address that for us? I sure can. Um, this is just my personal, how I see non-binary is I don't identify as male or female. I am outside of the gender binary. I actually not identify as transmasculine, which means that I have a more masculine gender presentation, but I do not identify as, again, either a man or a woman. Um, I'm happy to send resources um, to anyone actually that is interested in learning more about non-binary transgender individuals. Um, I know for me, I've been out as non-binary for six years now. Um, and that's been a big part of my journey and I'm grateful to be where I am today. I understand that a lot of people do not have that luxury to be out and to have access to medical care and treatment. And I'm very grateful for the treatment that I have been able to receive. And especially as a teenager, that was incredibly hard for me. I came out when I was 17 and it was not easy. Um, but I do want to make a drastic note that the, the opportunities for transgender youth today are more than I ever imagined possible when I was coming out. And there are many opportunities available to you, depending on where you live. Um, there are opportunities in the UK, there are in Australia and New Zealand. And if you need help getting in touch with any of these, I have contacts in Australia and New Zealand. I have contacts in the UK and I have contacts in the United States that are happy to help you. And Planned Parenthood is a great resource that can help you if you are interested in going on hormone therapy or anything like that. But again, personal journey, talk to your parents, talk to your friends, talk to your family. Definitely um, if you're wanting to explore things like gender identity. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, have you personally seen any roadblocks or been affected by anything um, because of, of neurodivergence and things like that? And if so, what? Yes, I have actually. Um, recommendations can you give to people? Yeah, I have um, hit a few roadblocks actually in teaching myself to code. Um, I have just calculated, so I am not great with math. Um, my mathematical learning disability is pretty difficult to overcome. And at certain points when I'm trying to learn things like JavaScript and they introduce concepts such as algebra, I really struggle with that. And that's been very hard for me. Um, so certain programming languages are more difficult than others to learn, especially for me if they have a more mathematical component to them because of my dyscalculia. So that's difficult. And there are also communication barriers too sometimes. Um, often you'll be working with neurotypical people and your tone via text might not match up with theirs. So communication can be difficult. You can come across, you've got to watch how you come across in text as you can, people will think that you're being rude when you're just asking a question. It's really hard sometimes to balance communication and you've really got to work at it. And it's something I still struggle with too, is how to communicate and how to do that effectively when people are often facing gaps between being neurotypical and being neurodivergent and communicating together effectively on a team. Okay, that's awesome. So that actually leads into another question which we got sure. um, here. It, it says, um, do tone indicators also have something to do with neurodivergence? I've seen them being used on Twitter to indicate that their message is serious, sarcastic, etc." Yes, actually. Tone indicators do have a lot to, and I, I, I like that because having that, it's helpful for me because I know how someone's saying something if they're being sarcastic, like the slash S for sarcasm or however I've seen. That's really helpful because often you don't know how someone's saying something and that's, that's good. I think Twitter has really opened up a lot of pathways to communication. And I, I appreciate everything that Twitter tries to do in terms of um, the one thing I wish they would do is add content warnings. That would be nice. Um, they, should, they should do that. They've got alt text now, which is better than nothing. 
Um, and I hate that that's the bar. The bar is so low that it's the lowest of accessibility bars. Um, but I hope they continue to improve. And I think that those communications by saying, this is a sarcastic tone, this is a happy tone, this is an excited tone, doing that is really helpful for people. And I definitely encourage that. I think it's really important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Let's see, there was one other question that I it's kind of scrolled up now. <laughs> so <I'm kind> of, <laughs> we lost it. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so yeah, there was one here. So I also have ADHD and ADD. Any tips on achieving the goals I set for myself? Is it possible to achieve them like quote unquote normal people? Yes, it is possible. And honestly, um, gosh, I have found I've I've tried for many years to do a planner that did not work. Um, that did not work for me at all. Um, if you can do a planner, those are very helpful. What did work is checklists. I am obsessed with checklists. If I don't put something on a checklist, it does not get done. It disappears into the void. They have really cute checklists you can buy at Michael's if you're in the United States. You can get them at stationery shops if you're in the UK. You can get them at Paper Plus if you're in Australia and New Zealand. Um, highly recommend a good checklist. You can do a bullet journal, also good. I saw a few good questions just come up too, actually just now, by the way. Um, but I definitely recommend checking out um, check boxes and checklists. There's apps on your phone you can do. Um, gosh, what's the name of it? There's so many checklists that are out there. There's Tiki Box, I think it's called. Um, it's on Google Play. Um, Tick Tick. Tick Tick is really good. I like Tick Tick. Um, Habatica, if you like gamifying your to-do list, um, is really good too. It's a little like RPG where you can be like taking your meds and you get points and you level up your little character and you can buy armor and like swords and stuff. It's really cute. I like it. Um, gosh, yeah. Another one is um, I'm on medication. I'm on Vyvanse. So I highly recommend. Um, I don't think, I don't know if they have Vyvanse for teenagers. I think it's a different one. Um, talk to your medical provider, talk to your doctor, say, I have ADD, I'd like to go on medication. Yeah, that's a totally personal journey, but I will highly recommend Vyvanse um, if they do have it for youth. Um, great medication for managing ADD, really helpful. Okay, awesome. And then I think we'll, we'll, we have one more question. That, okay. that It's kind of like a, a mix of a bunch of different questions. Sure, sure. Yeah. But if you are neurodivergent, mm -hmm. I, because a lot of times we, we have like this this mold, right, where we want to, everyone to fit a specific mold in order to work in the field, for example. Right. What are some instances where you've seen neurodivergence perhaps be an advantage of being in the field? I got a good one for that. Actually, my team here at Esper was doing a security audit, and we we're actually having to look through the pricing of said security audit. And um, nobody could read the pricing template and they were and I gave them the answer in about three seconds I was like it costs x amount of money and they were like how did you know that I'm like I read the chart and we they're like we had seven people trying to read that chart I'm like well I read it and that's the answer <laughs> and it was right and it was really nice that um my neurodivergence was able to get to finding that solution for our audit and getting our cybersecurity pricing locked in because nobody else on my team had um, gotten to that conclusion. So that unique ability that I had for my neurodivergent brain to see that answer and provide it to my team was really important. And it came in clutch when we needed it. Okay, Why do I contribute neurodiversity to being the person who could read a price sheet? Because um, the way that my brain works is that um, the fact that um, processing information visually is different than processing information through hearing it, um, especially when it comes to numbers. And I was the only person that was able to see that that was spatial algebra and that they were using um, algebraic equations to an extent that my neurotypical peers could not understand and could not process, but I was able to process quicker. So that was a major plus for neurodivergence. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Rin. Really appreciate your time welcome. today. Thank you. Uh, and you know, hopefully it's been beneficial to, um, to a lot of people here. I hope so.
Thank you again for having me. It was a joy.